This is the Great War Discussion Group. As you can see from your screen, and at least I hope all of you can see from your screen, uh, the topic for the day is the Pantheon de la Guerre, and the artist who brought it to the museum, Daniel McMorris. Uh, our speaker is Diane Spencer, uh, who I uh, believe is giving this talk. I, I believe this is your first talk for the discussion group. So doubly welcome, and thank you for, uh, for volunteering to give this. A couple of sort of caveats. Uh, I know my voice sometimes trails off. So if, if my voice trails off and you can't hear me, then you know, just, just let me know. The other thing I will apologize in advance, although my uh, genetic makeup is about 90% French, I speak not a word of it. And, and so all of the French names and French locations and whatnot, I am totally going to um, butcher them. I apologize in advance. And so if anyone has any sensitive French, French pronunciation ears, you may want to close them now. But um, anyway, thank you. Um, the, the Pantheon is something that has interested me ever since I started volunteering at the museum, which is probably, I don't know, three years maybe at this point. Um, and you know, like everybody else, I've read the little blurbs up in memory hall. And I just kept thinking there's got to be more. And then, of course, when the kiosks were open, I you know, went through the kiosks. And I just kept thinking there had to be more. And so this was a, um, agreeing to do this, this presentation was a great opportunity for me to actually do what I should have been doing, uh, which was doing the, the research all along. So uh, today, what I thought we would do is spend a little bit of time on uh, the actual creation of the Pantheon. Um, what it was originally comprised of, then talk about uh, um, when the Pantheon left Paris in 1927, came to the United States, had several years of, of um, non-success and obscurity in the United States. And then as Charlie said, Daniel McMorris was um, pretty much singly, single-handedly responsible for bringing it to the United States or bringing it to the World War I Museum. Uh, in, in looking at this and in researching and reading about Daniel McMorris and reading his autobiography and whatnot, I became uh, fascinated with Daniel McMorris. So I'm going to be spending some time talking about Daniel McMorris and then obviously what he did um, to the Pantheon. As several authors, I'm sure somebody thought of it first and then everybody else has repeated it, that um, McMorris both destroyed and saved the Pantheon. And I think that's a, that's a good assessment. So let's talk about it, uh, the beginning of the Pantheon. So the idea started shortly after the Battle of Marne, which as we all remember was in you know, September of 1914. So it was early, early in the war, um, but obviously they were having um, you know, the, the casualties were not good at that point already. Um, but the two primary artists, um, Pierre Carrier-Balouz Car Carrier and uh, Gourguet, uh, were the ones who really started it. Uh, Car Car Carrier-Balouz was really the originator. Um, he was a well-known artist and came from a well-known artistic family. His father and his brother were both well-known sculptors and artists. At the time that he started this or started thinking about it, he was 63 years old and was well established in not only the artistic community in France, but also the political uh, community in France, which proved to be very, very helpful. Um, Corgay, the, the collaborator and who joined him shortly after it started, was also very well established uh, in, in France. And at the time he was 52 years old. Um, and he specialized in, as it said, large scale architectural decorations. You know, they were both very um, patriotic. Um, one of the authors um, sort of speculated that maybe Gourguet's um, interest in this was that his largest work to date had been a mural which was completed in the basically city hall in a French city that had been badly damaged captured and was being held by Germany. And so he probably was just a little bit irritated with Germany. <laughs> and so he, he uh, wanted to help in this. 
there were about 20 other noted French artists who were pretty much too old to serve, which is serve on the front lines, which is why they were involved with this. In total, there was about 128 other artists. Uh, some of them were, um, you know, artists who came back from the front line for leave and, and would be involved. One of the things that I found interesting in looking at this is that all but one of the main 20-ish artists were alive and obviously in France and very, very French at the time of the French defeat in the Franco-Prussian War. So this was very real to them. And the, you know, the French patriotism was very real to them. They started with doing several hundred sketches um, of or what they were looking to do. And, and they knew they wanted to do it um, based upon the, the portrait. They, they wanted it to be portrait based. And so they did sketches of most of the portraits that were going to be in it. Um, because it was uh, from the beginning, part of the, what was going to be the, the French propaganda effort. And they knew that they wanted, um, you know, sort of the citizenry involved, if you will. So a lot of the portraits of the 6,000 portraits that are in the uh, Pantheon, the original Pantheon, came from stories and portraits and photos that were in the French press and um, in the French propaganda. And so much or many of the pieces, if we think about it, of the pieces and the individuals and the portraits that were in the original Pantheon were very well known to people in France because they had been watching, you know, been reading the newspapers and seeing the propaganda and whatnot since the very beginning. It also helped that when they wanted, uh, when um, the two main artists wanted to be able to have unique portraits of some, you know, never before seen portrait sort of thing of some of the main French uh, political and military leaders. General Galliani, who, uh, as we know, was the hero of Paris, uh, including sending soldiers out in French taxis to protect Paris, was among the first people to sit for the sketches. And of course, after you have um, Galliani sitting for your sketch, then in a, in a couple other uh, political people, then it became sort of a status symbol that you had sat for a sketch and were therefore going to be included in the Pantheon. And it was much easier to get people to sit for portraits at that point. People were sort of standing in line. The, um, the, and, and so for the first two years, really it was just doing the sketches, sort of planning, getting materials. As you can imagine, getting 18,000 square feet of Belgian linen uh, in the middle of World War I, it be just a tad difficult. And this is where, this and so many other places, is where the two primary artists' um, connections um, proved very, um, very handy. They were able to get these art, get these materials and get artists in the middle of a war that would have been absolutely impossible to do without them. Um, starting in, as I said, in November of 1916, they started transferring their flat sketches to what was the um, Belgian linen that was already arced. Um, it was already, so basically they set up the linen as a cyclorama in this uh, special built French building that we'll look at in, in a couple minutes here. And then they started painting directly on basically an arced um, linen which I think would have been, you know, because I think painting would be uh, difficult anyway. And then painting from sketches onto an arced linen that was 45 feet high would have been very, very difficult. And so they tried a lot of different things. They tried doing, you know, strings along it to um, um, help with the lines and to help with the proportions. What they ended up doing a lot of that was very helpful is they would take, um, uh, put the sketches on oiled paper and then put a special lantern projector behind the oiled paper, which would then display it, project it, if you will, up onto the linens and uh, made it much, much easier to at least get the outlines and the, the basics of the portraits that they wanted to put onto the linen. 
And apparently that was um, the way they, they got a lot of the at least outlines done. You can see from the picture on the right, um, you know, this was just the, 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 not only the sheer magnitude of painting <laughs> something that was 402 feet long, um, but also, you know, how do you get up to that level? How do you move around on the level? It, it was uh, an engineering feat in addition to an artistic feat. One of the things in my background is accounting and finance, and so I'm sort of a numbers person. And the business side of it, I actually found interesting. Probably nobody else would, but I did. It was a very unusual sort of a private quasi-official hybrid. Um, the, the Pantheon was actually owned by a, pub, by a public company, which was run primarily by the, the two main artists. Um, but they got money and other resources from the French government, as we had sort of talked about. Had there been any profits, and they were expecting there to be significant profits, the profits were to accrue to the private company, sort of like some of the things we talk about in the United States, that, you know, um, we were going to publicize the risk and privatize the profit. Um, the, this, this sort of peculiar arrangement where any profit was going to go to private individuals was not well publicized for the obvious reasons, you know, that this the Pantheon from the beginning was part of the propaganda. It was part of the um, you know, French patriotism. And it would have been a little jarring, I think, to the public for them to have been told pretty obviously that, uh, yes, it is, you know, it is French patriotism. But oh, by the way, if there's any profit, it's going to go to a couple of individuals. That probably would not have said as well um, with folks. And so it was just not well published. The original capital setup was about 850,000 francs, which is about $10 million in these dollars. Um, don't know, um, I never could find if they needed more money or if the French government put in the rest of the money uh, or not. Um, the special building, well, we'll take a look at the building in a couple of minutes here. The, the original composition, as I said, it was primarily pri patriotic and propagandistic. Um, it, was a, it was a partnership between, as I said, the two main artists, Carrier Bailouz, uh, who was the one who originated the idea and had a lot of experience with murals. He was the one that came up with the idea of having, having it being portrait based and having that background, that top background, um, representing where the battles had been fought. fought. Gourguet, who also had experience with murals, but he also um, did more uh, from a classical standpoint. So it was, it was uh, him who determined to use that sort of architectural framework that they've got and having a lot of the classical features, you know, the antique temple, the, the large statue of victory, that sort of thing. As we all know, originally it was 402 feet uh, long by 45 feet high. It was the first, or depending on, on who you talk to, the first or the second largest canvas in the world uh, at that time. There were more than 1,000 full-length portraits, portraits of wartime figures, both military uh, and political, and um, you know, basically um, movie stars who had done heroic things, that sort of thing. So this is um, a representation of what the um, it would have of, of what it looked like in the in the in the circle in the, as a cyclorama. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what in this diagram are sections one, two, six, and ten, which are deemed to be the French sections, and then we'll go to a couple of the others um, in a few minutes. So this was the um, considered to be the heart of the panorama. And it was also the largest at 122 feet uh, long. The, this was the Temple of Glory and the Staircase of Heroes. And this, this perspective is not really very good. So you can't get a good sense of um, the winged victory at the top. But all the thousands of French heroes uh, um, and they were things like the 
that they included, the first Frenchman killed in the World War, the first to bring down a Zeppelin, a, noticed, a noted Catholic poet who had been killed at the Battle of the Marne, a celebrated teen heroine who was the last member of her family and had warned the French troops about um, enemy positions and had somewhat improbably, the story goes, killed five Germans while she was doing it. Um, a popular French author who had asked to resume active duty at age 59 and was killed early at the Battle of Verdun. So a lot of these were, uh, particularly in, in below, were noted French people and um, well known, again, from the uh, French papers and propaganda uh, soldiers as you go back. And then it just sort of goes back. And so the idea was that um, yes, this is a representation of some thousands of French heroes and French soldiers, but the thousands and at this point hundreds of thousands of French heroes stretch all the way back. Uh, in, the, in the very uh, bottom is also a French 75, which the French were, were pretty um, taken with, and then also renditions of flags, including German flags underneath the cannon that had been captured in various battles uh, as time went on. This is the other um, significant side, sort of on the, it was on the opposite side of the hemicycle, if you will, from the um, Temple of Glory. And this was, although it wasn't called the Temple of the, uh, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, but it, that's what it sort of became. And it was significant for a number of reasons. One, uh, up until this point, the, the concept of the Tomb of Unknown Soldier wasn't as, as highly uh, known, as highly thought about. Um, there's an insignia on the lower wreath at the bottom that says um, to the Patriots, and then an insignia, um, I'm sorry, the lower wreath to the unknown heroes, and then on the, the actual print itself uh, to the unknown heroes. At the top, and you really can't see it here, this is, I could not find a good um, rendition of this section. Part of it was that um, the people who saw the Pantheon, you know, originally commented on that the artists had deliberately painted this section much darker, which makes sense, you know, but, but it just means that there was not good renditions of this section. Um, at the bottom there by the, actually it's at the top of the steps with the bottom of the plinth is a single woman mourner and her face is, um, her back is to us and her face is to the pedestal, uh, which makes her sort of the every woman mourner. Um, and she's weeping Mary-like, her face is turned away. So she's sort of the, the gamut of wartime female mourners, wife, mother, sister, daughter, that sort of thing. At the very top, and you really can't see it, there are six um, French soldiers who are holding um, a casket which is topped by the French tricolor flag. Um, and again, this was you know, sort of the, the opposite side of the, of the hemicycle. Uh, I tried to, I wanted to show you that section again. And so you can see that section to the left of this uh, rendition. It's um, a little bit out of, well, it's, it's quite a bit out of focus. A lot of these came from postcards. And so uh, the coloring and the, the, the focus was not so great, but it gives you a sense on how the uh, monument to the dead um, really towered over the rest of it. Um, the, the rest of the, um, um, except for the, the two sections we've talked about, the Monument to the Dead and the, the uh, Staircase of Heroes, pretty much the rest of the um, Pantheon was the, the same sort of structure, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. But the top part was the top about two thirds was a topical topographical map of the um, Western Front. There were towns and battles in gold. The, the, the uh, lettering was different sizes and different brightness depending upon the size of the battle and how well known it was. And again, all this was well known to French citizens from news and propaganda. Obviously the, the biggest um, lettering and brightest lettering was for Verdun. That was obviously the battle that was revered 
the most in the French, uh, among the French. Also on this section and in, in the sections that we've just talked about, you will notice, and, and in fact, it was commented on at the time, that the almost total absence of modern weaponry is very striking. Um, there's a, a French 75 and a few artillery pieces standing there. But other than that, there was none of those humongous artillery pieces from World War I. There were no machine guns, there were no tanks, there were no gas masks, no significant reference to trench, uh, to the trench, to trench warfare or to the trench experience, which made it really the whole thing sort of this highly idealized throwback to uh, a previous era. Um, particularly in the throwbacks to a previous era were these two sections. And again, these are two of the sections that I pointed out in the original hemicycle. Uh, these are from, um, obviously from postcards, which were made at the time. One of the ways they tried to raise money from the, from the Pantheon was to do postcards and postcards were very uh, popular. And actually the postcards are still circulating. I looked, you can still buy the original postcards on eBay. I gave some thought to it and decided that I mean, they're, and they're not, I mean, they're like 20 bucks. They're not, not horribly expensive. But these were, you know, talking again about um, um, no heavy artillery, no trench warfare in the original Pantheon. And it was just really this throwback to another more genteel, idealized era. And these, these two sections in particular, um, were basically cavalry, and, and we know how how um, effective cavalry was in the war. And by the time they paint by in World War One, by the time they painted these, obviously they knew that cavalry was was um, not effective and had been you know largely discontinued. But the artists continued to paint it because that was the idealized version of the French cavalry, um, the highly the most romantic branch of the French army. I find it interesting that, again, these are just um, postcards, but the, um, they represent the two sections of the Pantheon, as we all know, I don't, think I'm, I don't think I need to do any spoiler alerts, that the Pantheon ends up being cut into pieces when it comes to Kansas City. And these were the two pieces that uh, McMorris had known that the Hossman from Boston, or from Baltimore, excuse me, particularly liked these sections, particularly liked the uh, cavalry. So these represent the two sections of the Pantheon that McMorris sent back to Hossman. Um, and he displayed them in his restaurant in Baltimore until the restaurant closed in the 1990s. He was quite partial to them. At one time he did um, fundraisers, including a fundraiser for the American Red Cross for people who would want to come and see these sections of the original mural uh, as they were mounted in his restaurant in, um, in Baltimore. So back to the panorama again. And um, so the other six sections were, um, so, so of the um, basically 10 sections, uh, four were reserved for the French section and the other six were allocated to the six or to, excuse me, to the 23 allies uh, of France. I want to go back to speaking to how the, um, the Pantheon, as in, you know, in, in its hemicycle, was sort of separated. Um, each hemicycle had four discrete sections with, with the pylons. And then each section, uh, as I said, about two thirds of the top was that topographical map. And then below, there was a wall that was about twice as high as the people were shown, and then a shallow platform in front of the wall with four steps leading down to sort of a base. The Allies section in one hemicycle was Great Britain and the Commonwealth, Belgium, Italy, which joined the war in 1915, and Portugal, which joined the war in 1916. Uh, and that all made a lot of sense. And, and those were, uh, I think, done um, you know, reasonably early as, as, it was, as the Pantheon was being painted. I think they had a lot more trouble with the other hemicycle. Uh, Russia and Romania, as we know, Russia left the war, um, was pretty much bowing out by 1916, 1917. Serbia and Montenegro, you know, all the issues with Serbia. And then the last section, I'm sure, is the one that they just pulled their hair out. Because the last section was originally going to be the sort of Central and South American and then the Eastern allies. 
Um, and then the French, the United States had to go and enter the war. So they, they basically had to completely repaint the entire last section and painted all the other people out, uh, except for just a, a, a few Chinese and a few Greek folks and made the United States um, the, the bulk of this last section. And you can see who else was in there. The last four countries, Haiti, Honduras, Liberia, and San Marino are represented only by their flags, which is not, um, I don't have a problem with since they didn't send any people to the, to the war. If you're gonna, it's not gonna send people, you have to be able to live with just a flag. Great Britain, when we're talking about their, their, the Commonwealth and their dominions, it's also, I don't know, I, I find it interesting in, in the exhibit hall, how the, there's only a Great Britain flag. There's no Canadian flag, no Australian, no Zealand, no South Africa, no Indian, because they were part of the Commonwealth, part of the, the, the dominions as they called them. This was the original, sort of original US section. Um, this was before it came to the United States. And in, in they apparently originally wanted to put a Persian who the French were very fond of um, at the same level with Wilson. They were, it was explained to them that they could not put it, you know, within the military structure or within the hierarchy in the United States, they could not put a military leader at the same level as a political leader, which was apparently okay to do in France, but not okay to do in the United States. And this is called the US section, but as I was just saying, it's actually a section with all the Western hemisphere and Eastern allies. Um, there are some women in here, but they're primarily nurses and a few uh, well-known women heroines. This is a little bit bigger. This is the whole, it's called the US section, but again, it is primarily US, but there are some of the non-US um, allies included in this. The, the representation of this is not very good, and I apologize to it, but apologize for that. But as I said, it's 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 from postcards, and and uh, this section is gone and has been for, gone for a long time. One of the things that I guess I had not realized in in looking at this in Memory Hall is that the the pedestal behind Wilson is actually topped by a bust of George Washington. I guess I had not really noticed that it was George Washington. Um, and they, that was very specific. Um, you know, George Washington obviously was our leader during the Revolutionary War, and we were helped considerably uh, by the French in our Revolutionary War. And so George Washington um, and having a bust of George Washington was sort of reminding people all over again that, that um, they came to our aid once, and so it's only fair that we would go to our aid at, at this point, as well as just sort of emphasizing the French and US uh, historical ties. Wilson is, is depicted um, delivering his speech to Congress on April 2nd, in which he urged the United States to, to join the war. Um, there were some of the portraits in here were actually done after the uh, Pantheon was open and was shown to the public. Um, Persian, Pershing did not sit for his portrait until 1919, and the US ambassador Myron Herrick did not sit for his portrait until 1922. So this is, um, the Pantheon has been sort of a living um, work of art since its beginning. And we talked about, and so again, I'm sort of a numbers person. So when I was thinking about how big was it and how, you know, 402 feet is sort of beyond my ability to think about it. So I tried to think of how else, what, what are other uh, things that we're familiar with that we could sort of juxtapose to get some sense for it. So the Pantheon, the original Pantheon was 402 feet long. As we all know, a football field is 300 feet long. So as I was thinking about this, so if Tyreek Hill were to get the football on his own goal line and race all the way down the field to the other goal line and score a touchdown, had he been running the length of the Pantheon, he would not yet be finished. He would have another 102 feet to run. In terms of height, it was 45 feet tall, which is about the, the height of a four-story building. When it was set up, when the Pantheon was set up in uh, circular in, in the hemicycle, the diameter sort of from one side to the other side was about 130 feet. Um, and so if you think about the width of a football field is about 160 feet 
or the the width of a basketball court. So it was basically two and a half basketball. If you think about the two and a half, the width of two and a half basketball courts, um, um, as you would walk from one end of the the panorama, one side of the panorama to the other side when it was in the circle, which, which just amazes me. Or if, if you think about it also like a basketball court is 94 feet long. So if you were to walk from one side of the Pantheon to the other side of the Pantheon in the, the hemicycle, you would walk about one and a half times the length of a basketball court and you would still be within the Pantheon, which just sort of boggled my mind. And then as though my mind just, let's you know, blow the mind a little bit further. So what would be the area within the uh, circle of the, of the Pantheon? And that was about 13,000 square feet. And a basketball court, again, is about 4,700 square feet. So it's about two and a half basketball courts. So if you put two and a half basketball courts together and then put um, the Pantheon around that, that's about the size it would have been, which is just, to me, amazing. That, that, that sort of put it in more concrete terms that, that I could I could sort of deal with. So the, the Pantheon actually opened on October 19th, 1918. Uh, President Poincaré uh, opened it. Uh, and surprise, surprise, the next day when the public was admitted to it was the beginning of the fourth war bond drive. Uh, I'm sure that was not a coincidence, uh, particularly since there was kiosks inside and outside the building to sell the war bonds. This is a, a photo of the actual building where uh, the pan was built. A, the, the land was given to um, the corp the, this private corporation. I never could uh, determine actually who built the building, but this was not a temporary ramshackle building put up for a temporary exhibit. I mean, this was a real building um, and it was right there uh, for anybody who's been to Paris, right there in front of the, there's a big open expanse uh, in front of the uh, in, Invalides, and it was right there in that big open spans, expanse, and it's just a few blocks from the Louvre. So this is not in some suburb where it was just, you know, a building hastily put up in a suburb that nobody's ever going to go to. This was in the most sacred and most uh, valuable land in Paris. Admission was uh, 2.3 francs, half of that for ordinary soldiers and non-commissioned officers. Um, I was sort of uh, interested in that. That converts to uh, about $32 today. So admission then was about $32 today, which at the end of, of France, after all the war years, uh, was, was pretty significant. I was thinking maybe we should raise our admission for the museum. Um, many, if not most, of the US soldiers who were returning um, went through the Pantheon, including Harry Truman, who had been obviously in Europe, including Harry Truman and Daniel McMorris. There were about 8 million people uh, that went through the Pantheon. Um, and that was at a time when the population of France was about 38 million. Um, so that was a significant number, even including all the Americans and other people who came through on their way um, to or from. There are um, a lot of um, first person stories about people going to see it, including by Truman. Um, there was a separate underground tunnel that people would go through this sort of darkish underground tunnel and then sort of pop into this fantastic, humongous um, panorama that had special lighting and people talk about just how uh, incredible it was and, and how patriotic and emotional it, it was. Then there were separate rooms outside the Pantheon um, that had some of those original sketches that the artists had been, been doing and accumulating all those years and other supporting information uh, about the Pantheon and about the war. It was apparently pretty spectacular. I think it would have been a lot of fun to do. Uh, sadly, that building um, quickly fell into disrepair when the Pantheon left and was used for a couple of other things. And then uh, eventually was a garage and was finally torn down in the 60s. And it's back to being um, just open ground there again. 
the French interest in the Pantheon um, started to wane pretty shortly after the armistice. There was a victory parade in 1919 after the treaty was finally signed. Uh, in 1920, there was an official Tomb of the Unknown Soldier sort of there under the Arc de Triomphe. And then there also started uh, war, tour, war tourism, where there were actual guides and tours of trenches and battlefields, um, which is sort of about the same time, you know, in that final film at the museum, they talk about a program of the um, American government where widows and uh, mothers could go on special trips to Europe. And that was all part of this sort of war, war tour, tourism that was taking people on tours to trenches and battlefields. The other thing that was happened was, as we've talked about before, the Pantheon was very idealistic, um, um, sort of the, they referred to it as the, the general's view from above. And after the war, some of the actual uh, soldiers' journals, which were the, the actual view from below, the actual how horrible trench warfare was, how war, horrible war was, started coming out, including things like um, uh, books like All Quiet on the Western Front, and really sort of mocked and uncovered all this uncritical propaganda. And so the war pretty quickly, um, the, the view of the war pretty quickly changed. In the US, on the other hand, the interest in the war was increasing, partly because you know, we, we sort of believed we won the war and um, you know, winning a war and, and without horrible, horrible casualties. Um, and so the Pantheon was seen as um, a significant recognition of our participation and our uh, overwhelming abilities in the war. So they started talking about sell, about um, selling it and bringing it to the to the United States. Um, by then, the the Pantheon was hugely unprofitable because it was very expensive to maintain. It was hugely unprofitable in France, and some Americans with some money showed up, and um, the Pantheon was actually purchased by three U.S. businessmen for the equivalent of about um, I think it was about twenty million dollars at the time, or, uh, uh, current dollars at the time. Uh, important to all of this was the sponsorship of the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation. The Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation had uh, Monticello, but it was in pretty bad shape and they only had uh, limited grounds around it. So they wanted to raise their visibility. They wanted to raise money. And it was deemed as, you know, between Jefferson, who was very beloved in France and Lafayette. And so they sort of came together with this idea that it was part of this um, Anglo-French uh, or U.S.-French uh, partnership. And so the, the sponsorship of the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation was very important. Also sort of symbolically, the farewell, farewell ceremony was held on March 27th, which was the 150th, 150th anniversary of General Lafayette leaving France to help in our Revolutionary War. Of course, everybody at that point said, oh, it'll be back, the Pantheon will be back, don't worry, don't cry, it'll be back, and it didn't really happen so much that way. At the, at the farewell ceremony, the French Minister of War thanked the two million American soldiers who crossed the sea in the face of submarine danger to protect uh, a land which was not theirs. Um, McMorris was at the farewell ceremony. Um, also there was Mrs. Whitney Vanderbilt, who was pictured in the American section because of her war work in France. She was the one who cut the seams that bound the panorama's ends with gold scissors. And of those scissors, one blade uh, was presented to the Army Museum at the Invalid, and the other one was presented to the Jefferson Memorial at Monticello, which apparently is still there. I've, I've been to Monticello a couple of times, so I don't remember seeing the gold blade, but apparently it, it's still there. One of the things that made this a little more uh, dicey was by then the French goodwill towards the United States had also largely dissipated. Um, yes, we had helped, but then we demanded that France repay its humongous war debt, uh, as well as U.S. Um, uh, wealthy people from the United States were flocking to France and all of Europe 
and buying up French art tra treasures and, you know, um, chopping up some of the French chateaus and shipping them all to the United States. Um, France, and in fact, Europe was not real happy with this and they considered a bill to stop it, but um, they were also unhappy that the United States had entered the war so late and was given so much credit when uh, we had lost so many fewer men, uh, more like 40, 50,000 versus a million and a half uh, for France. One of the artists, Gourguet, actually we went, was able to go to the ceremony, but he actually died uh, about five weeks later, partly from heartbreak or so it was said. So now we move on to the to the road trip. It was a, a openly commercial venture in the United States, not, not surprising. They, they made some changes. The artists made some changes. Actually, they were made before they left Paris, but they were made to make it a little more amenable, um, a little more attractive to the American audience. Colonel House, who was very popular in France, um, he had, um, as we know, was a... a the primary aid to Wilson and was very involved, particularly in the uh, treaty negotiations. He had, um, he was, but, 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 but by then he had become unpopular in the United States. He had just issued a, uh, an autobiography, um, a memoir really, um, which gave some behind the scenes information about Wilson and some other um, people and he had become very unpopular. So he was gone. They added, um, there was a sort of concern about not enough African-American, so they added another African-American, a surgeon who had been highly decorated in France. And then they added more women. Uh, Booth was head of the Salvation Army. Sanger was head of the American Red Cross. Um, Dr. Lovejoy was a pioneering woman doctor who went to France during the war, and then she joined the American Red Cross. And so there were a lot of these changes that were, but as I said, they were actually made in France. So you probably can't blame us for making those changes. When it got the United States in terms of um, highbrow, in terms of patriotism, it was all out the, it was, it was a spectacle here. It was, um, as, as one of the authors author said, it quickly went from being sacred to being a spectacle. Um, shows here where it, um, the different places it played, it never ever was pop. Uh, was um, pop. Well, I mean, it was somewhat popular, but it was never profitable. Uh, one of the places I believe it was Chicago, actually had a lot of people come through it. But that's because almost like one would be the Belgian week, and another week would be the Italian week. And so during the Italian week, they would bring all the the local Italian politicians and have free admission to anybody you know of Italian heritage. So there were a lot of people coming through it but um, not too many people paying for it. Um, even to the point that um, in, in, in the first one in Madison Square Gardens, they expected it to be on display for four months, but it closed after eight weeks. The Jefferson Foundation was hoping to make lots of money off of it, but they never got a dime. And at a certain point, they just said, you know, we're out of here. Uh, we don't, we're never gonna make money off this. We don't like what you're doing to it. We're just out of it. Um, so that was where, what happened to, in the United States, but it, it would uh, show someplace for a while and then it would go back in its little box and it would show someplace and then it would go back in the box and the box would be shipped to and from Baltimore. The total obscurity of Baltimore. Um, it was in storage at the H.A. H. A. Davidson and Company in um, Baltimore. As it was moving from exhibit to exhibit, it actually was stored inside a building. After San Francisco, it was deemed to not have much value, and so it was stored outside. And so it was a it was a zinc line box, but it still got wet, and it was just outside for a number of years. Uh, all of the time, the storage fee was accruing, and H. A. Davidson tried to get it, um, couldn't. They um, some folks in French in France tried to uh, say that it belonged to the French government and there was some research and it turns out it did not belong to the French, French government. They tried to um, uh, raise money in France to buy it and bring it back to France. They were not able to do that. So finally it went to auction uh, in 1952. There was a lot of interest but few bidders. Um, and our friend William Hosner was there. Uh, one of the things I found interesting 
he was a veteran of World War I, but he was a German veteran. And the, the mixed feelings he must have had about this whole uh, French pantheon after having fought French, uh, the, the French army and the Allied army uh, for a number of years, and I'm sure losing a lot of friends and family members, it had to be sort of mixed emotions for him, but he bought it. At the bidding, they talk about how the auctioneer opened the bid at 50,000 and most people quit laughing. Then he asked for 25,000, people laughed a little bit more. So finally he asked for an opening bid and Hosner offered $1,000. There were a couple of other bidders and Hosner finally got it for $3,400, which was the amount, basically the amount of storage. Uh, and that's about $33,000 today. There was an article in Life magazine about this, which is what McMorris saw and what first uh, alerted him that the, the Pantheon was on the move, if you will. Hosner, this was a 1953 article. He found a, a circus lot that was larger than a football field, had it um, paved, um, sort of paved. Um, and then they, they pulled it out and unrolled it. And as, as the, the press said at the time, for several hours, the new owner marched over and up and down the length of the painting accompanied by a crowd of sightseers, a dog, an ice cream vendor, and a helicopter. Then Mr. Hauser said, I think it's real pretty. Uh, and that was the end of it. He then had the canvas rolled up and sent back to storage. Hausner wanted to keep the, the Pantheon intact, but he it needed a building, obviously, and he couldn't afford that. Um, he approached the state of Maryland. He approached the Smithsonian Institute and the American Legion um, and all of those either had no interest or particularly with the American Legion, they were busy trying to um, care for the veterans coming out of World War II because it was now um, 52, 53. As well as by then, the art world had moved on. You know, in 1952, those um, like the, the Peace Bridge in Hiroshima was very abstract. And so the, the style of art had changed uh, we had moved on to World War II, not World War I, so there was really uh, no interest. But one of the things in the, world, in the uh, Life magazine, and this has nothing to do with the Pantheon, but I thought we could all use a little break by now. I found the ads in this 1953 Life magazine just fascinating, and I'm, I'm sure that all of us here either had an alarm clock that looked like this or put Vaseline hair tonic on our hair while we had a cigarette hanging from our lips. I don't, I don't need to see a show of hands, but I'm sure there was, there was some of us were there, right? I just found that if you ever, you know, just sort of trolling through the internet and need some chuckles, go to those old life magazines. The ads are just uh, a hoot. So then the story switches to Daniel McMorris. As I said, he had been in the war. Um, he had seen the Pantheon. Um, and then he's, and in between, he had actually studied with one of the artists, Corgay. Um, Daniel McMorris had, in 1925, when the, when the, um, let me step back, the, the Liberty Memorial, Liberty Memorial, as it was known at that time, was getting ready to open. They, they wanted some uh, murals or some decoration in Memorial Hall and Exhibit Hall, as we now know them. Um, and so they had a competition to paint uh, murals and McMorris um, tried to, he submitted into that, but he was very young at the time and he did not get them. But as part of that, uh, Gorgay encouraged him to do that and had him go back and see the Pantheon again in Paris. So McMorris had, had seen the Pantheon, had studied under one of the primary artists, and so he was very, very, very familiar with it. Uh, McMorris was really, to me, very interesting. Born in Sedalia, Kansas City Art Institute. And then he worked for the Star for a number of years. At that time, apparently, the Star uh, did not believe in photographs and would not allow photographs in the Star. It had to be all original art. And so people, you know, illustrators, as they were known, uh, like McMorris, were hired by the Star to illustrate ads, to illustrate stories and whatnot. He also served in World War I, as I said, he was part of the photographic unit um, and moved back to Kansas City, basically into the 30, in, in the 30s. 
Among other uh, things he did here was he painted the vestibule here in Kansas City, the vestibule of the main entrance and the ceiling at Roselle Court at the Nelson. He was married three times. He actually was married four times, twice to one woman. He married a woman who, uh, whose father started a company that I later worked for, which I found very interesting, um, you know, to sort of the, the history of that. Um, and um, her name was Dorothy um, Sells. They were married in September 1923, and they moved to Paris as newlyweds, which I think would have been just really cool. Um, they did have a son who was born in 1925, and then he moved back in 1929, and they got married in 1930. He was married again, although, according to the records, although he never talked about it, and, and his biography did not mention that particular marriage. Then, and, but they did have a son um, who um, apparently did not keep necessarily touch with them. Then he married in 19, again in 1938 in Kansas City, um, a divorcee named Helene. Within a few years, she filed for divorce alleging indignities. I'm not sure what indignities were. I didn't realize that was grounds for divorce. But anyway, they, the breach was soon mended and they got married again in 1946 and were married until her death in 1973. And McMorris died in 1989. There's a couple things about McMorris I just found so fascinating. Uh, he was originally drawn to engineering, but apparently his teacher in, we're talking um, high school, probably junior high or high school at this point, um, said, looked at, looked at some of his drawings and his doodlings, if you will, and said, well, you can either be a mediocre engineer or a good artist and suggested he became a good art, become a good artist, which he did. He also was a pro professional quality photographer, which makes sense that he was uh, in the photography unit in World War I. There's a story about he did the first aerial photograph for the Kansas City Star. And so he went up in one of those, you know, the old open airplanes and, and with the heavy camera and was leaning so far out of the airplane that the pilot landed, um, tied McMorris to one of the airplane struts and then went back up and only then would he let McMorris you know, sort of lean out with his, with his heavy camera. He was fully ambidextrous, which had to be very handy as, a, as an artist, particularly some of the, you know, the work that he did, although his right hand was slightly more steady. He was a longtime member of Unity Temple based here in Kansas City, worked in a lot of mediums, and his full name was Leroy Daniel McMorris without the A. At some point, he dropped Leroy and added A to McMorris, um, I guess he thought that was more artistic. His son, interestingly, um, went by McMorris without the A, and his former wife went by McMorris without the A. McMorris lived the sort of life that I think we would all like to live, you know, trips to Taos to paint with friends, living five years in Paris, uh, studying art as newlywed. When he came back from Paris, went to, to New York, and he got uh, a studio and living space, like a little loft sort of thing, in Carnegie Hall. He said that from his bathroom, he could hear the orchestra tune up. He got a major decorating job at, at uh, one of the estates on Long Island for a standard oil tycoon. Spent time in Newport. He had a three-month fellowship at the Tiffany Estate on, on Oyster Bay, which was just down the road from the Roosevelt's at Oyster Bay. He was, as I said, a lifelong um, member of Unity, but he wasn't just a member. He, he was associated with, his, with the founders who were, were alive at that point, apparently was close friends with one of their sons. And he designed all the color schemes and the stained glass for the current Unity on the plaza. Give you a little sense for McMorris's work before uh, the Pantheon. So on the left is an ad, uh, an illustration for an ad in the Star in 1919. And then 1921, you can see um, a charcoal work he did of Union Station. He was a very good artist. Um, he became known, sort of, for painting on screens, fireplace screens or full-size screens. And there's one, and, and particularly with classical uh, figures in them. 
But he also, you know, even as late as 1969, he was experimenting with pastels doing floral arrangements. And of course, no discussion of Daniel McMorris would be complete without, um, he famously did a portrait, an oil portrait of Fall Gallon in 1956. This is McMorris in his studio in 1974. Remember he, he um, was around until 1989. But back to the museum. So um, one of the, remember, um, so one of the first things that he did was the mural that is on in Memory Hall on the west wall over the door. This was of the uh, site dedication in November of 1921. And it has the five uh, generals who apparently had never been together before or after that. And this mural was completed in 1950. It was the first thing that, um, that McMorris did at the World War I Museum or Liberty Memorial that was, as it was called then. So on the east wall of Memory Hall, and so this is the uh, mural that um, the original competition in 1924-1925 McMorris had uh, applied for that, um, that contest for that competition and did not get it because um, he was deemed to be too young. It was actually one by um, the artist was Guerin, and Guerin uh, at that point had just completed two large murals at the Lincoln Memorial uh, in DC. And so that was why um, the, art the um, artistic commission or committee um, picked Guerin rather than McMorris at the time. But, you know, so we get to the late 40s and 50 and now McMorris is back and Guerin is gone. So one of the things that uh, McMorris said was that uh, Guerin's mural was in terrible condition and it needed to be repainted, which he did repaint it. But one of the authors sort of mentioned that subsequent conservation of this mural revealed that it was not in such bad shape underneath uh, McMorris's uh, repainting of it. So maybe there was a little bit, you know, he, he didn't win it the first time he wanted to get, you know, wanted to repaint it uh, at this point, uh, or wanted to put his name on all the murals in memory hall. But he did brighten up the, the, color, the original color scheme had apparently been much more muted. And so McMorris um, brightened and updated the color scheme on the, the in memoriam, memorial on the east wall of memory hall. And then of course, McMorris did the three murals on the south wall in memory hall, the gold star mother, women of World War I and the blue star mothers. Um, as we know, uh, a gold star mother is a mother whose uh, child dies in the war and blue star mothers are the ones whose children uh, return. In it was in 1951 that McMorris, he, he had been um, commissioned by the Liberty Memorial to put a mural or murals on, on that wall and apparently had pondered on this several months. And then in 1951, he said it just sort of came to him um, um, fully there. Um, he painted the, the central portion, which was dedicated in 1956 and then painted the other two portions, which were done in 1966, but not dedicated until 1970. The first unveiling coincided with a meeting in Kansas City of the Women's Overseas Service Association. So they were able to have uh, one of the meetings of this women's group in the in Memory Hall to for the unveiling of this mural. Then also in the um, exhibit, the temporary exhibit that is currently in exhibit or in, in Memory Hall is the Scotsman and um, uh, McMorris painted him. Um, this gentleman was at the dedication in 1921, and, and McMorris just found, his, found the gentleman and his coloring fascinated and asked if he could paint him then. And so this is not a mural, it's just a painting that is part of the temporary exhibit and memorial hall, in memory hall. So then we get to the Pantheon. So now we're up to night, um, um, Hosner buys it in 1952, and McMorris, um, schmoozes and, and um, is in communication with Hosner and his wife um, from 1952 until 1953. And he's really deemed to have single-handedly, unilaterally secured the Pantheon. 
um, for the memorial, um, which was great because then, you know, that plus the, the trust that the Liberty Memorial Board had in him at that time, he pretty much could do as he decided that it needed to be altered. Um, the Liberty Board, the Liberty, and so um, one source said that Haussmann donated the Pantheon to McMorris, who gave it to the uh, Liberty Memorial. Another source said that Haussmann donated it directly to Liberty Memorial, who I'm not really sure. Um, but anyway, it got here. Um, and then the Liberty Memorial Board approved it in December of 1956. So it got here in January 30th, 1957 on a special railroad flat car. Um, this 10 foot long crate that I sound like the same crate that it had left Paris in because it's um, 10 foot square, 50 feet long and zinc lined um, came in on a special railroad flat car to Union Station. Belger Cartage uh, and their cranes uh, unloaded it and carted it up to Liberty Memorial. Um, McMorris worked on it for two years, uh, taking uh, extensive photographs of it. And then he cut it into 22 strips that were between 15 and 21 feet wide. He, McMorris referred to it as whittling a novel down to a Reader's Digest condensation, um, um, yeah, condensing it down to a Reader's Digest version. Um, then McMorris and others, including librarians at the Kansas City Public Library, spent years extensively researching um, the actual Pantheon, who was in it, who they knew about it, uh, amassed a small archive of the catalogs, newspaper clippings, postcards, letters from people who are familiar with the panorama. Um, the librarians at the library, at the re public library, tried to research the identities of the figures. Um, McMorris even posted a query in the International Herald Tribune soliciting information from people who might know about it or who have been there. And he actually um, got a response from Carrier Car Belus's daughter, Pirette. And apparently she was um, very useful, um, had a lot of information, provided a lot of her father's information and papers, uh, made them available to McMorris. So um, what McMorris and his assistant added, they thought that um, uh, apparently McMorris saw the Pantheon as a tribute to Wilsonian idealism. So he wanted to find a Wilson quote to put at the top of the comp to put at the top of it, but he couldn't find one, so he made up one. Um, and so at the top is the quote that we demand human justice and peace sustained by the laws of man based upon the tenets of God to make the world free. Um, he painted in Franklin, uh, um, President, by then Franklin, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt, um, primarily based upon the fact that Roosevelt had been the Secretary of Navy during the war, and Harry Truman primarily because Harry Truman was, uh, had been president and um, lived in Missouri at that time, and they thought that would make it um, more attractive to the Kansas City audience. Um, they also painted in Colonel House Comes Back, and the two principal painters are now in the, in the Pantheon for the first time because they had not painted, the, the two principal painters had not painted themselves into the Pantheon. Um, they took out almost all of the French section, although part of the Temple of Glory is used in that mural that's in exhibit hall that we looked at before. The entire monument to the dead was gone. That entire landscape of the Western Front, that, that top part of the, two, the, the top two thirds uh, was gone. And then they took out a lot of British and British and other um, international military leaders. Here's a photo of uh, McMorris and some assistants pouring over uh, what would become the um, U.S. sort of what had been the U.S. section, but what would become the, the Pantheon as we know about it. Found it interesting. Several authors or several people commented that the American section at that point was swaggering and, and strutting, which I had not thought of those terms, but after I read that, whenever I look at the Pantheon, swaggering and strutting come to mind, and I think they are fair representations. This is a photo of McMorris on the ladder painting with the right hand at this point, um, you know, touching up, and you can see where 
From here, you can see that there is either a border or a damaged area um, just to the right of where McMorris is standing. And obviously that's not visible today. So it gives us a sense for what an incredible job that he and his assistants did making it all so seamless and, and repairing uh, damaged areas. Wanted to show, I don't have a lot of examples because there's not a ton of information about um, the, the, the of most of the most of the pantheon is gone now, but this is one area where there was um, part of it is still remaining, and then there's information and and um, repli replications of how it was originally and how it is done now. So this is that temple of glory, the staircase of heroes, and so we can see on the left how it looked in the beginning, and how it looks now. Uh, apparently, one of the areas of um, changing the Pantheon that McMorris took the most heat for was this section because he basically put, you know, we can see here the, the inscribing that's at the top of the door frame and um, people didn't like what he did with it, but they really didn't that he put it over a door frame. And so what could have shown even more of it um, doesn't because there's a door there. Which brings us to our current Pantheon de la Guerre, which was dedicated in 1959. So questions? I'll try to answer questions if anybody has any. Well, first, Diane, that was a magnificent presentation. Thank you. Uh, I think the uh, there's just such a story there, and you told it very well. Uh, Thank you. What about it? Everybody got, have some questions or comments to make? Hey, I wanted to ask Charlie about um, Husner because um, um, I have uh, run into some people from Baltimore when I was in memory and um, I, I guess, uh, Diane, you said that uh, he closes um, restaurant or the restaurant was closed in the 90s. I think 99 is, is what comes to 99. mind. Okay, okay, that sounds closer. And um, they said that um, the restaurant was, um, you know, a kind of a landmark in Baltimore. Uh, it was turned into more of a special event kind of venue mm -hmm. um, before it closed. Mm -hmm. And I believe they said that there was still some of the uh, Pantheon art in there. Um, and you, you thought it was um, related to the cavalry or the horses? Yeah, the, the, two, uh, the two cavalry sections are that the, the North African and the, I mean, not, not sort of the normal cavalry, but um, the materials that I was looking at said that parts of those sections actually ended up, uh, they're the only parts of the Pantheon to actually make it back to France. That at some point, Hausner or um, his heirs sold them or sold parts of them and, and they made it back to France. So, and, and I understand some parts were, were gifted yes. by McMorris slash the museum, but do we still have some portions of it in storage? Yes. We do. We do. Uh, some years ago, there was actually an exhibit uh, <clears throat> in the hall uh, about that, that featured many of the fragments that we still have. And you can still, there, there are occasionally fragments on sale on eBay, for example. I remember going to Hausner's when I was in medical school in Baltimore. Uh, there may have been fragments of the Pantheon there at that point, but I wouldn't have known it. There was, Hausner's restaurant was simply packed with artwork. He was an absolute uh, I, I would, I'd almost say an indiscriminate collector, but he was certainly an obsessive collector of art. And there were pictures, uh, you, you couldn't see any walls, you just saw pictures. And it was, going there was like experiencing having a meal in a museum. Uh, and it, be, it was at that time a major landmark. And uh, I remember going there two or three times and it was just very impressive. And if you had to walk to your table, you did it by winding your way through all sorts of pillars with uh, busts and statues and urns and whatever else he'd collected. 
Oh, absolutely, absolutely. He, yeah, I think he collected this because it was the. I think it probably he learned about it, and it probably sort of drove him uh, slightly batty. So he went to the auction and managed to pick it up for a relatively small, a very mm -hmm. small amount, mm -hmm. even by today's standards. Uh, but he was the sort of man who who did collect all of these things, and I think it mattered less to him that it was French than that it was this big piece of art, uh, and it was about a war that he had served in. And a great story. That's what I, I remember. I, I went to uh, working for the city of Kansas City in the 70s and 80s, was in Baltimore several times, and ate at that restaurant at least twice that I can remember. And I remember it looking like a museum, but I didn't know anything about the Pantheon at the time, other than when I was a freshman in high school in 1958, we went down with a number of people in our class and watched McMorris work on the painting up on the scaffolding on the wall. They let us in, the room was covered with uh, pieces hanging everywhere and all that, but they had a little path in there and we watched him dab paint on the wall. Didn't mean a whole lot to me at the time, but it does now. I had a quick question for you. Uh, <clears throat> I've read the book uh, about the Pantheon twice and I'm on my third go through because I find it fascinating. Did you have any other particular resources that you use that you can suggest to us or point us toward in terms of learning more about particularly uh, the figures that are in the, uh, uh, the section that's, that's in Memory Hall? Um, the, and also, uh, you know, any other resources that you might suggest for us? Um, I did not spend a lot of time on the figures. The uh, kiosks in Memory Hall, if they over, ever open again, are a great source of information on the figures and, and the, I mean, the actual people, as well as, you know, this represents this or this represents an you know, American nurse or whatever. Um, um, just in terms of the, the information, I, I didn't see a ton of information available other than the kiosks on who the figures are. YouTube uh, has a... Uh... There's a program on YouTube by the guy that wrote the book that we have on the Pantheon de la Guerre. Yeah, and it, uh, so there, which has when the good. author was here, yeah. he was uh, he stood in front of the painting and just talked for about maybe it must have been an hour and a half, almost two hours. Yeah. I would have stayed there for the entire afternoon if he kept talking. Uh, a particular interest was how he stumbled across and first became interested in the painting when he was looking and working and doing something else. And uh, it just kind of caught his eye and his attention because he had lived in Kansas City for, what, a very short time when I think he remember him saying he was about eight years old or something at the time. His parents were diplomats, I believe, weren't they? There are books available that the... Um... Uh, books about McMorris. The, he has a memoir, as well as some books about him and, and books. Um, there's one in particular that um, has, it's, it's sort of him rambling story of his life with examples of his, his work, his sketches throughout his life. And I found that very interesting. Um, you know, just sort of the, the life of an artist, the, the, uh, and, and his um, his development and his uh, trying different media. And, and I, I just found that very interesting also. It has nothing to do, it has a little bit to do with the Pantheon. He mentioned the Pantheon and it's like five pages or something, but it's just his life, which I, I found him to be a very compelling figure also. Claudine, uh, I think you had a comment, a question. Uh, I wanted to uh, say that I also have been to Hauser's restaurant. And I saw the sign that said, more art upstairs. <laughs> and when you walked up the stairway, then you saw a piece. And I can't remember what piece it was, but you saw a piece of the Pantheon. All right, all. Well, thank you again, Diane. That was a marvelous job.